Welcome to the Chinese Canadian Museums podcast, The School Room. I'm your host, Melissa Lee, CEO of the museum. To kick off our inaugural episode, let me take a minute to talk a little bit about where we are. We are inside the first Chinese Canadian museum in Canada, the oldest building in Vancouver Chinatown, the Wing Sang Building. And uh, we're so pleased to begin our digital program, this inaugural podcast. And for all you listeners out there, hello. So we opened on July 1st, the 100 year anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act. We have different exhibitions and we hope that this podcast will do what it can to go more in depth about these exhibitions. Our first guest is curator Catherine Clement. She has curated our feature exhibition, The Paper Trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act. She is a longtime community curator. She's curated other important exhibitions, in particular related to Vancouver and Vancouver Chinatown. Another exhibition that she's curated is on the Chinese Canadian photographer Yujo Chao. Catherine, hello. How are you? Hello, I'm great. Thank you, Melissa. A lot of people have come through and seen the paper trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, or we're just calling it the paper trail for short. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the paper trail is all about and what visitors can expect to see when they walk through the exhibition? Well, the Paper Trail exhibition is a 100th anniversary exhibition that uncovers a dark but largely forgotten period or chapter in Canadian history. And uh, it's a national exhibition, and it features the largest collection of early Chinese head tax and other surveillance and control documents that have ever been displayed publicly, because very, very few exist in, in public archives. So these were all privately gathered from families from coast to coast. It's a very moving and eye-opening exhibition because it unlocks this paper to reveal this story that I said is largely forgotten. And it does it in a way that looks at the fear, the despair that this act caused that's been forgotten, as well as unlocking stories of, of perseverance and enormous courage in the face of tremendous headwinds at the time. In that way, it's very revealing because this story has not only been forgotten in Canadian history, it's been forgotten a lot by our own community, the Chinese Canadian community, and uh, purposely, purposely forgotten. It was such a, um, a difficult period of time, almost 25 years, that when it was over, finally, after the Second World War, the goal of the Chinese community at that time became just to simply blend in, forget about the past, blend in, integrate, disappear, not wanting to be noticed anymore. So within a generation, we lost this story of this really powerful and very despairing and dark period in our history. So this exhibition uses these papers and other papers to help retrace and find the trail of that story to bring it back to life. Myself going to work every day and seeing the exhibition, I know firsthand how moving it is. But can you tell us a little more about that time period, just for our listeners who may not be as familiar, uh, just the time period leading up to the head tax and after the head tax moving into the Exclusion Act? Well, the Exclusion Act actually symbolically was made law on July 1st, 1923. The government specifically chose Canada Day or what was called Dominion Day back then to introduce this law. But prior to that, there was actually always forms of exclusion only on Chinese. And this is what's been very interesting is to see that of all the migrant groups coming into Canada, the Chinese have a unique distinction. They're the only ones to experience exclusion. And they're the one group for which there was excessive, fanatical, almost obsessive compulsive documentation on the community. 
But exclusion actually begins before the Exclusion Act. It starts with the very first head tax, which a number of people will know uh, was brought in just as the railroad was being completed. There were thousands of Chinese recruited from China to come and finish the railroad through the British Columbia Mountains because no white workers would take those jobs. So as the railroad is coming to an end, the government, especially the government in BC, is thinking, well, geez, we don't want these guys to stay. And we certainly don't want them to bring over their families or children. So they started advocating for the first head tax. And that kept on going up and up and up. And yep, there was still Chinese that were coming to Canada. So then they eventually changed the laws and expanded exclusion to include not allowing uh, laborers to come in after the First World War. And then they started changing the age at which children would be allowed. So that kept on going down and down and making it harder for families to reunite. And when none of that worked, when it didn't get it down to zero immigration, they brought in the Exclusion Act and it was successful. But, but what's interesting, though, about the act, so, you know, we hear, in fact, the, the community called it the Cruelty Act initially, which is, it's very interesting. And in, in the exhibition, we explore the use of language and what language the communities used back at that time, as we have found in the Chinese press, which reveals how strongly they felt about what was happening to them. So we have a, a newspaper headline on the wall from November 1922, and it says, the headline says, must bar Orientals completely to say BC for the white race. So the governments were very open about what their, their intention was. But the third paragraph down said that initially what they were looking at was to bar Chinese, Japanese, Hindus, and all other A Asiatics. That was November 1922. By July 1st, 1923, it was only Chinese. So why was that? Why was this specific targeting of people of Chinese descent over any other ethnicity? I think there was probably a number of factors. One was that there were more Chinese here, right. uh, especially in British Columbia, where the whole movement for the head tax and the exclusion act came out of this province. Also, China was a very weak country at that time, just in complete disarray. It was easy to pick on their nationals versus Japan, who was a rising military power at that time. India was one of the colonies they were relying on, the British a lot. So there was a sense that this was an easy group to go after. And I think I often say on the tours that I do that Maybe it would have felt different for the community if all Asians were caught up in that act. But in the end, when you're the only one that's targeted, there's sort of this idea like, why us? Like, why us again? We're the only ones that had to ever pay a head tax to enter. Now we're the only ones subjected to exclusion. So there was extreme racism, but geopolitics was also at play yes. in the specific exclusion yeah. of the Chinese people. And there's a hierarchy of racism, as there is even today in other countries. So we were, at that time, we were at the top of that pile. Can you talk a little more about how the Exclusion Act really impacted families or the ability for people of Chinese descent to have families at that time? Well, this, that's probably the biggest trauma of all that it, that it created for the community. There were some families here. We we're in a building that was owned by Yip Seng, a man who was a merchant. And in those days, merchants were king. There were very many of them but they lived rather holistic lives. And they could, even though they had so much wealth, they were also able to bring over their wives and children without paying the head tax. But for everybody else, there was the head tax. So when the Exclusion Act comes in and locks the community down, we have a real disparity in the community that starts to get amplified. You have here thousands of men, Chinese men, many of whom are married, who are here supporting their families back home. 
at least with the head tax, there was some hope you could bring your family over. And now they've gone to no hope. And interestingly, in the research that we did for this project, we begin to see in the one year between when the act goes in and everybody is required to register. That was the other part of the act is everybody had to register. In that one year before the registration deadline, we see a lot of things starting to happen. We see men coming unmoored. We see a number of men just losing it. And some of them are being admitted into an insane asylum. Well, whatever it was, that act was the last thing that broke them. We found a number of articles on men taking their lives and leaving, you know, these desperately sad notes about tired of life. We also find uh, in the clan societies a lot of letters of men, old men now, begging to go home and not wanting to die a ghost in a foreign land, but being so destitute and poor that they can't even afford a ship's ticket to go home. So that's just that one year between July 1st when the act comes in and June 30th, 1924, when the registration has to happen. And then everything locks down. And that's for almost well, 94 years. Yeah, yeah, 94 years. In that time, we have the great stock market crash. We have the beginning of the long Great Depression. We have Japan invades China. We have the beginning of the whole Second World War takes place. And all the while, you have people stuck here, often in the 30s, even unable to support their families now over in China and wondering what are happening. There, a number of men lost their wives when Japan invaded and families died and they could never go back and see their families again. You know, you couldn't go forward, you couldn't go back. Many men couldn't return home, but they can never bring their wives here. And even after the repeal of the act, you have hundreds and hundreds of Chinese bachelors that will spend the rest of their lives here. But in addition to that, because children were so rare and families were so fragile here, the few families that were here, that you also have this situation that if something happens to one parent, it could be cataclysmic for the family. Right. And that's one of the stories that you feature in the paper trail. Can you talk a little bit more about that story? Yes. We have a story of a man named Ma Tin Yik, and he's living in San Arm, BC, which is in the interior of British Columbia. And he's running a hand laundry. And in those days, hand laundries work hand laundry. And you'd be working seven days a week, 14, 15 hours a day. But interestingly, he has a wife. So he obviously was industrious enough that he could pay for a wife to come to Canada. In 1923, the year the Exclusion Act goes into effect, he has a little three-year-old daughter. And his wife gives birth to another little baby girl. But she develops an infection, the mother, and dies. So now here he is with an infant and a little three-year-old girl working long hours. He is no longer able to bring over a wife, and he certainly can't afford to buy a wife. And there's so few women here in Canada. The Exclusion Act registration shows like 48,000 men and 1,300 women. 1,300 Chinese women. Chinese women, yes, yeah, sorry. So, you know, the pickings are few. And he's put in this untenable situation where he's told, you either got to sell your daughters, which is the way adoptions were done in those days. And, and because children were so rare, they would have been snapped up automatically. Or you have to put them in an orphanage. And the only orphanage is hundreds of miles away in Victoria, where they will raise them. He has to make a difficult decision, and in, in the end, he chose to put them in the orphanage and at least have some occasional contact with them. Is that why he chose the orphanage? We believe that's why he chose right. because if they would still be his in a sense. If they were adopted out, he would lose all ability to keep connected with them. And for him, those were his only two children in his whole life, were these two little girls. So it, I just, I feel it's so sad. It fragmented families exclusion, not just those between China and Canada, but even within Canada. If someone died, that was it.
And can you tell more about how you found that story? It kind of leads me into this idea of how one does research, but this particular story has a happy ending. It does have a happy ending, and we have a lovely photo of him with his daughters. Uh, one of them went to serve in the war effort and became this model citizen. There was two things that were very challenging about this project. One was that almost all the material is crowdsourced. And we had basically three years to do that all across Canada. Can you talk more about how one crowdsources research? Oh, God. <laughs> it's just, you start with people you know, and you tell them about the project you're doing, and then you rely on others to tell two people to tell two people to tell two people. So that's how it happened. It's a slow process. I, I did another project about 12 years ago, which was very similar, but I had... I had eight years to do that project. Uh, so this was much more intense and, and then condensed, I should say. And so besides finding these pieces of paper, these head tax and other surveillance documents, which there are very few in public archives, we also wanted to capture the story of the person who owned that document. So while there's still anyone alive that has a memory of them, and this is where many of our stories came from. And so it was actually one of his granddaughters, Martinique's granddaughters, who submitted the certificate and then told us the story. But we also have a number of stories for which we just simply stumbled upon. Mostly those who were, who were bachelor men, who remain bachelor men, who have no descendants to tell their story, no one to remember them. We don't have their certificates generally in the uh, in the exhibition, but we found them in other ways, and that was more intensive because that involved finding their paper trails without anybody to tell us anything. We went through all the Chinese newspapers, ones published in Canada between 23 and 47, and just looking for stories, English newspapers. Often we'd find something small. And from there, that would lead us on this hunt to do this person justice, this man justice that, who, you know, was here 100 years ago that no one remembers and to find their stories. So it's a mix between given stories provided by families and some stories that we have to find. When I walk through the exhibition, it really feels like there are two overarching themes, which you've really encapsulated in the documentaries you also shot. One, which is the breaking of families due to the Exclusion Act, and the other is those men that were never able to have families. And when I walk people through the exhibition, what really hits people hard, people from all walks of life is really the Chinese bachelors. <laughs> so I see this as such a key theme in this exhibition that people find really, really moving. Yes, and, and yesterday someone wrote to me because he had been through Bachelor's Alley, which is where we we place them in a special section that told those stories. And he said to me, as I was reading it, he said, I suddenly remembered my own bachelor in my life, who was my uncle who stayed a bachelor. And he said, I never gave much thought to his life, but he would take me for movies every Sunday. He says, but reading this and, and, and seeing these other stories and understanding their context, it made me really think about what his life was like. And many of these uncles, supposedly, weren't uncles, but they were just men who, because they longed for their own families or had not seen their own children for decades, would in some ways adopt a child here. And, and interestingly, in, in the film, we talk a lot about how a lot of the memories of around food are entertainment. That's highlighted in the film. I remember some of the children that are now grown up probably in their 50s or 60s. Yes. Or even older. Yes. Or even older, and they talk about the bachelors being ad hoc babysitters yes. with them while their parents worked. So it, in the end, became this extended family in the Chinese-Canadian community, which was out of necessity. But also there are these deeper stories behind why 
it was important to have that sense of family. Can you talk a little bit more about your interest? Because this is the second exhibition focused specifically on Chinese Canadian community that you've done. Can you talk more about what interests you about this particular part of history? Well, I think um, you say I, I'm a community historian. I sometimes say I'm like a street historian because everything I've learned about Chinese Canadian history has always started at the ground level. It's through interviews with people. I started my work in this area being interested in World War II veterans. And in fact, everything I've done since then has always had my a genesis in things that they told me or things that I saw in their albums and you know boxes and things like that. And I think my my particular interest is always in the lesser known stories or the forgotten stories. There are some people in the Chinese Canadian community everybody's heard of, and those are wonderful. But I think when you start speaking to everyday people, you realize everybody made a contribution. And it's so easy to be forgotten, just like the bachelors were forgotten. This photographer that I found, he was forgotten. Oh, can you tell me more about the photographer? His, the photographer was named uh, Yu Cho Chow. And I first started seeing his work when I was interviewing World War II veterans, and I asked to see their photo albums. And I kept on seeing this beautiful little seal on photographs of them as children or, in, you know, in their teens or in, during the war years, and it had the name Yu Cho Chow on it. So by the time I had seen it with the sixth family, I thought, oh, I should just Google this guy and see who he was. And there was nothing on him. And that led me, I wasn't thinking of an exhibition at the time. I just thought, from now on, I'm going to scan his work and just keep it to the side. And eventually what happened was I started to learn about him. I learned that he was the first Chinese photographer in Vancouver. He had a little commercial studio here in Vancouver's Chinatown. He photographed from like 1907 to 1949. So during all this period that we're talking about here, the exclusion and before that, and the reason he was nowhere and his work, we couldn't find it in the archives was because when the studio closed, they took five truckloads of negatives and brought it to the dump, thinking no one would be interested in it. But what became interesting about him was that he was not just the photographer for the early Chinese community, like all through this period of change, but he also was the preferred photographer for the Black Canadian community, for the South Asian community, even amongst the white community, that was a pecking order. So Ukrainians and people, Slavic immigrants were at the bottom. She was their photographer. So it was such a rich story. He had photographed everyone who was marginalized. And back then, a white photographer probably wouldn't take your photo if you were South Asian. Didn't want you in the studio. All, we're booked today, we're booked next week, or oh, we're booked next month. So he became this place that documented all these early communities. It became this huge thing, and I kept on collecting, kept on collecting, and then did a, his first solo show. <laughs> and that actually resulted in even more photographs coming in. Now all the scans have been donated to the city of Vancouver. So the same thing is actually happening on this show. Absolutely. People are seeing these. I've seen that I had tax certificate or a CI-45 and we're asking people to continue to contribute so that we will have this incredible archive as the real long-term legacy of this project. You spoke a lot about being a community historian, being a street historian, but you're also a curator. So the way that you manifest your research is through exhibitions. What interests you about curating exhibitions as opposed to writing academic articles about the research you've done? What is really appealing about being a curator for you? Well, it, it almost goes back to the idea of a street historian. It's bringing history out to the public. So a number of years ago, I did all these history windows here in Chinatown where we took empty storefront windows and put large murals on them that were talking about pieces of Chinatown history. 
And curating an exhibition is that same way. You know, it's different than doing it on a website or doing it as a book. It's an immersive experience. And I also love design, so it, it kind of brings together another love I have quite separately, which is all in design and allowing people to have an experience as they go through. And you've heard me say this too, I, in this exhibition, we've tried our best to design it and to tell stories, but it's not just in helping people know this history, but to help them feel this story. And you do see people feel it. I mean, I know what I've been through the last four years. I can't do another project quite like this again because it's been, it was very emotional to do this project surprisingly, but I see it in the visitors. It's walking through a space and the colors and the design, and there's a lot of repetition and a lot of clipboards that we're using, but it's all designed to be part of that experience to reinforce that idea of excessive documentation, but also to make it really human by showcasing some of these stories with a photo that brings, you know, now you're looking at this person. The clipboards are designed so that one person at a time actually reads the story to create a more personal experience of reading that one story versus a big pal where you've got 20 people around you. And some of the certificates that are featured I've noticed, of course, people going and finding their ancestor, but also really really prominent Chinese Canadians. Alexander Gamiao, the first Chinese Canadian born in Canada, right? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the reactions that you've noticed or that have moved you during the course of the exhibition? Well, the interesting thing about a crowdsourced exhibition, this is the same with you, Churchill, is that people do react much more because they're not just, again, getting information there's a part of them in that exhibition. And often the biggest reaction is, is when someone sees their grandfather up there, they start to tear up. And your uh, museum assistants have talked to me a lot about that, about just not sometimes knowing what to do when someone starts tearing up. But part of it is because they recognize that their grandfather, who was maybe just ran a produce store, is actually featured in a major exhibition. It has his little moment in the sun, right? That he's recognized that he existed. He's not just in a cupboard anymore. She's on a wall for everybody to see. And that means so much for the Chinese Canadian community, particularly at the beginning when we were talking about how Chinese Canadians were specifically excluded in Canada to now opening the exhibition and having our ancestors honored in the first Chinese Canadian museum. So it feels like we've come a long way and maybe some of those tears are happy tears. They're not just tears of sadness. They're happy tears. Yeah. And someone once used this phrase about making a pilgrimage to Vancouver to be part of this because it's you know, we've waited a long time for this museum. For considering the impact that the Chinese Canadians have had and how early we were here and how we helped build this country, it's amazing we had to wait this long to have our own museum. But it's, I think, for a lot of people, it's this idea of taking a little bit of time out to learn about what their ancestors went through and to pay tribute and to remember those who have no one to remember them. We've had a lot of visitors from across the country and North America even in these two months that have come to visit the paper trail. I really feel like we're doing this work for the community and we are so lucky to do this for our community. We are doing the work that hopefully everyone benefits and continues to do more work about it. Absolutely. And there were times on this project, like it almost killed me this project, when I just kept on thinking about these people that I was doing it for, well, especially those who have, who have left and who were so silent about what they went through, that this was kind of our chance to pay tribute to them. But what's interesting for me too, is we have a lot of white visitors, as you know, Melissa, and to see how many of them are affected by this. One common refrain is, I never learned this in school. This is new to me. And others, though, also feeling the story the same way, like this deep sense of, of awe 
that's good because I don't want people to think it's only Chinese Canadians that can come to this museum or come to this show. This is a Canadian story. This is part of our country's history. It's part of a narrative that we hope to build for a more inclusive and diverse Canada, or those that build Canada were more diverse than one learns in history. Even myself growing up here, I only really remember the head tax and that part of Chinese Canadian community as really a footnote, not a main feature in the history of Canada. So I think what your exhibition is doing and what we hope to do at the museum is to really change that narrative, not just for Chinese Canadians, but for Canadians everywhere. Absolutely. So there is still time to come and see the paper trail in the first Chinese Canadian museum in Canada, located on 51 East Pender Street in the oldest building in Vancouver Chinatown. Please come and see our exhibition in Vancouver. I really want to thank Catherine for taking the time to do this episode with us and to talk more about the paper trail. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. This podcast was recorded on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. I invite you all to reflect on the territories that you're on and the host nations. To learn more about the Chinese Canadian Museum and book tickets, visit us at ChineseCanadianMuseum.ca and follow us on Instagram at CCMuseumBC for updates. The School Room was produced by the Chinese Canadian Museum and edited by Rosalie Gunawan. It was engineered and mixed by Connor Blakely and Kalani Serpanchi. The theme music and original audio was created by Joshua Young. Stay tuned for next month's episode of The School Room, available wherever you get your podcasts.